Good evening, Western Standard viewers, and welcome to Hannaford, a weekly politics show. My guests this week are Faith Grolo and Kelly Lynn Perry. And before I go any further, I should warn viewers that some of this may be hard to watch. Faith and Kil Kelly Lynn are women who transitioned to present themselves as males, regretted it, and have transitioned back again. The experience has been difficult, painful, and a profound well of regret for both of them. And they are not back where they started. That is, it is not now all as if it had never happened. For the benefit of others, however, they join me today to tell their stories. Faith, Kelly Lynn, welcome to the show. Thank you. Faith, can I start with you? Uh, just tell us, please, what happened? So I was gender questioning by about 15 years old. I had found a show called I Am Jazz. And so science was telling me that this little boy could be a little girl. And I believed that the doctors wouldn't do it if it wasn't okay. So I was justified in my thinking that going against my religious family was okay that their concerns were just because they were old fuddy-duddies and they didn't know what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. So by 16, I was seeing doctors and I was given puberty blockers. By 17 and 18, I had been approved for top surgery and I was given testosterone, which is the cross-sex or wrong-sex hormone for me. And uh, by 18, I had aged out of the clinic because it was specifically for youth. So the doctors who diagnosed me and prescribed my medications did not follow up with me. I was deemed a successful transition to them. Uh, however, by 2020, because of COVID, the testosterone I was getting, they ran out of the vials. So I had to get a more expensive medication that I couldn't afford. So I was changing medications without much supervision. Um, and then it was changing the dosage as well without much supervision. By 22 years old, I realized I didn't need to rush and I really wasn't using it consistently. So I stopped all medications. Um, and I, around 23, 24, found some information that basically solidified the idea to me that my doctors didn't really know what they were doing, uh, essentially allowed me to diagnose myself incorrectly and just affirmed that rather than actually questioning any of it. And so I began to detransition uh, April of this year, actually, and uh, started to come back out as my natural self. What does it mean to detransition? Stopping all medications and no longer further pursuing any uh, surgical or chemical changes. And I transition. believe you told me earlier that you had not had any kind of surgery. Correct. Okay. Kelly Lynn, can I ask you then, please, what's, uh, what, what's your story? I grew up, I, I, I'm an adult who lives with the history of childhood sexual exploitation. In that house, there was a lot of abuse, drugs, and alcohol. Um, when my mother left her pedophile husband, he went to jail for sexually interfering with me. Um, then she got back together with my biological dad. He also was an alcoholic. My 20s, my 30s were cycles of drugs, alcohol, sobriety, relapse, and just circling in that. In my early 30s in 2002, I got clean and sober. And uh, in that process, I, the degree of social anxiety, um, the discomfort I was living in women's support recovery, and it felt like the emotions of the people around me were just happening to me. And I met um, some individuals who were transitioning themselves, and I was asking them about it, and they're like, oh, people who question like you're 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 wondering if you really are a woman and the on, only people who are trans question that and then when i spoke with it my drug and alcohol counselor about that she was in what's called the affirmation model so she affirmed that of course a man living in a sport recovery house would be incredibly uncomfortable it wasn't about my like I look back now and I realize that I wasn't able to regulate my emotions around so many other people. So I was constantly trying to control the other women. Um, so just affirming my discomfort with my sex as it being about 
the envy I had for men was this feeling of being a male. Hmm. Okay. Um, I think I think a lot of men, women do see advantages in being male. You have obviously both looked at it from a male point of view as well as a female view. How would you answer them if they said to you, "Oh, so I want to be a man because," and then cited off all these advantages that they perceive? Let's start again with you. Um, I would first ask if they know all of the risks truly of what they might be doing to themselves, which unfortunately you can't possibly because we haven't had proper clinical trials. So nobody really knows long-term what happens to kids who are on these drugs and any information we have is not mm -hmm. too great, so. And how, about, how, how would you answer them, Kelly? Really, what motivates men to do the things they do to make the sacrifices they make to for their career is very different than what motivates women. I learned that during my years as a long haul trucker. I was in a specialized industry where ninety percent of my colleagues were men. Mm -hmm. And so you were a truck driver as a woman. No, when I looked like a man, when I had six inch beard, mm -hmm. all of my coworkers thought I was a man. Um, I really learned that men and women think very differently about stuff. I'd worked there for about five years and one of my colleagues commented that you realize, my legal name then was Kenneth. So he's like, you realize Ken that we are all very afraid of you. And I'm like, why? I'm like so calm, so easy going. He's like, exactly. No one has even seen you mildly upset. So they were convinced that if they ever upset me, I would just explode because I'd never been in the hierarchy and figuring out where guys get mildly upset and aggressive towards each other and they figure out where they are in the QE. And of my 45 coworkers, nobody knew where I was in the QE. So it, it, it was a moment of going, men think about things very differently than women do. Even looking like a man, even being on testosterone, I didn't understand their world and their worldview. I don't want to make light of this in any way, but who knew? Uh, can I? This is such an important decision that a, especially a young person would make. That you've told us that the doctors didn't give you very good advice. You've said that your parents were, uh, you described them as old fashioned fuddy duddies who went to church. I can imagine what their advice to you would have been. Um, and then you mentioned a, a program that you had seen, or jazz or something. What? I am jazz. I am jazz. What is that? So Jazz Jennings is an individual who was transitioned when they were younger. Uh, born a boy, about two years old. Mom saw a little boy dressing in dresses, playing dress up with his sisters, and said, oh dear, he must be a girl. And ended up taking him to doctors who transitioned him at a very, very young age, started puberty blockers, and gave the cross-sex hormones, eventually had surgeries. This was all televised on TLC. All of it. All mm -hmm. of the surgeries. A 17 year old little kid. So it that mm -hmm. made it seem very, very normal and commonplace. Not only that doctors were doing this surgery, but it was being televised like it was nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, and Jazz seems extremely happy in these videos for the most part, because that's how it's supposed to be portrayed. Where is he now? Um off the air. Some, yeah, there's been some emotional issues. Um, even in the shows nearing the end of it, it was seeming like this poor kid didn't know who they were and didn't feel like themselves. And mom just kept saying, oh, no, well, it's okay. You're exactly who we say you are. Don't worry about it. It's okay. Like it, it, there was no attempt at dealing with the emotional distress. It was just continue affirming whatever's been done. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just, you know, you can only do that for so long. So he's a physiologically mature 20, early 20s, right? I think he's 19, 20. Yeah, I believe he's younger than I am. Unable of experiencing arousal. Like neurologically incapable from the drugs and the surgery. So cannot mate bond with another human being. Well, that would seem to be, first of all, I, I think the scope and scale of this is that around about 
the five-year period from uh, 2018 to 2023, uh, according to the government of Canada, there were 600 young women under the age of 18 who had sexual reassignment surgery, mm -hmm. uh, roughly half of which uh, went the whole way. Um, what is the... How does it, what is available to, I think we do the surgery under the, the, the provincial health programs, mm -hmm. but if you want to go back, do they help you do that? No? Oh. Okay, so you're, uh, what sort of expenses are you in, involved with to transition back to a uh, woman you were? Well, what's called breast restoration surgery, I cannot access in British Columbia without the approval of the trans Transcare BC. Mm. So my doctor will be, I'm in the stage of getting the paperwork together. My doctor will send an application into Transcare BC, the people in charge of transitioning, um, to request that I be allowed to have access to surgery to restore the appearance of having breasts. Because um, I had a complete bilateral mastectomy in 2008. So, okay. Um what are the physiological effects when you transition? Like what do you experience? How does your how does your way of life change? And then how does it change again when you transition back? Now you were just on the you were just on the chemicals. I'm gonna ask you about yours in a moment, but how does it go? Uh, essentially for me, I had already started puberty by the time I was 16. So they shouldn't have given me puberty blockers anyway. And so when they did, it completely interrupted the puberty I had already started going through. I went through menopause. I was then given testosterone, which is a known carcinogen, and it forces you to go through a male-like puberty, which I got a deeper voice. Um, my facial hair and body hair started growing in darker and thicker. Um, I gained more muscle mass and it was distributed differently than it would be for a woman, uh, which made me fit differently in clothes. But the problem is male clothes still didn't fit properly because I had the bone structure of a woman because I didn't get the puberty blockers before puberty. Mm -hmm. So that didn't really help anything. Um, my balance actually went funny because if you're on puberty blockers and testosterone, your breasts essentially deflate. And I was also using a chest binder, so it made them squish down. So my center of balance actually got shifted. Um, puberty blockers, because I did not finish out my puberty properly, it stunted my physical growth, my emotional and mental growth. It actually keeps you stuck in a teenage-like state mentally because um, you don't grow up to be able to make those long-term decisions because you're suppressing all of the hormones that are supposed mm -hmm. to help you do that. Mm -hmm. With me, I actually was fortunate. I ended up going off of the blockers a little early because I was on birth control, which did something similar, but the doctors still didn't really know what they were doing. Just kind of let me do what I wanted and, and experiment on myself. Um, and so when I went off of the puberty blockers, my, my system kind of kick-started again a little bit. Uh, so then I came out of menopause, got to go through it backwards again. Um, and then once I was off of testosterone, uh, I ended up trying to finish out puberty. I'm still in the midst of doing that in my 20s. And I'm realizing my joints haven't fused properly. I may have incontinence issues because I've gone in and out of menopause now. Mm -hmm. And so my pelvic floor may be weakened. I may have liver problems, potentially. That's a common side effect now. That's um, the testosterone. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and then there's also the option of the spinal cord doesn't fuse properly all the time. And so there are people who get compression fractures because of that, because they're not getting the proper hormones in there. Um, I may also be infertile, but we don't know that until I actually try to have kids. Um, I'm very optimistic that I'm fortunate enough not to be, but, mm -hmm. you know, we don't actually know until I try it. Um, but yeah. And I'm one of the luckier ones. Like I, I, have come out essentially unscathed in a lot of instances compared to that. So, you know, I'm so the worst case for those who did not come out unscathed is exactly. in a few words, what? 
Um, so there were some people that I was transitioned at the same time as who have now since attempted to detransition or desist, but the government would only cover the actual tissue removal. Mm -hmm. If you didn't have the money to cover the reconstruction part, then you're a girl now with no breasts or nipples. Um, some of them <clears throat> also will have hysterectomy. Some of them will have uh, a phallus made. Um, there is someone in the States, uh, Scott Nugent, is what they go by. Uh, born a female, was transitioned as an adult, made these decisions as an adult, went through all of the surgeries, ended up with horrendous infections that almost killed them several times, are now still killing them. The forearm that the phallus was made out of uh, is now not functional properly, and they get chronic infections in the arm, and the hand that's attached to that arm, they may have to lose that as well. Um, and these are decisions that an adult made, and now we're giving those complications to children. Good gracious. Yes. But, yeah. Were you ever suicidal? Yes. They weaponized that completely. So were you suicidal because you wanted to be a different gender, or were there other issues? There were several other issues that so were So those issues were not properly diagnosed? And you were allowed, against the wishes of your parents, who would have been the most interested in your welfare. Did teachers have a role in this at all? Uh, fortunately not, but I was surrounded by a lot of people who were very into the affirmation model. And our teachers had the signs of it's a safe space and all inclusion. And there were actually several trans individuals um, in the schools that I was around. So I was exposed to it. But then there was also a local group um, of, there was one trans adult and a supportive adult. They had a youth group, basically, like a support group for gender questioning or trans youth. And it was specifically for 17 and under. Is there anybody who could have headed you off from the course of action that you took? The doctors. Absolutely. The doctors? Mm -hmm. Is it that they don't know or that they don't care? I presume don't care. Don't care to know. See, Kelly Lynn, you've heard Faith's story, probably not for the first time. And what's your comment on, on, on what she experienced as you reflect upon your own Well, experiences? in a similar way as an adult, there's so much information they didn't give me. Like they didn't tell me that, they told me that taking testosterone, I'd have the same health risks as a male, as any other male actually. Um, women on testosterone, especially with me, I have obesity. I have a highly elevated risk of type 2 diabetes, which I now have and I'll live with for the rest of my life. They didn't talk about how um, now, our secondary... Can, can sex stop you there? Were these, were these doctors in general practice or are these specialists endocrinologists. in this field? Endocrinologists. So these, they should have known. Yes. And should have told you. Yes. They would have known and they should have... Yeah, should they should have talk. informed me and discussed with me because I already Did had. Did you push hard? Get, uh, I asked, what are the health risks? And um, I was specifically going to an endocrinologist because I already had hypothyroidism. Mm -hmm. um, so, which is considered an autoimmune disease and type 2 diabetes is also considered an autoimmune disease. So, The proper course of action when a doctor is prescribing a new medication or a medication off-label, when they observe something out of the normal, is to inform the pharmaceutical company that owns the patent. This is what I'm seeing in my pop patient population. Mm -hmm. It appears that that is not happening as it's intended to happen in this field. And uh, the WPATH files indicated the degree to which WPATH discourages the endocrinologist it trains from doing this because they were actually discussing instances of liver cancer in females taking testosterone. <laughs> so. We are almost out of time, which is a dreadful shame because we're, this is a, a deep, uh, very, very deep subject. But I do want to ask you particularly, Faith, what you think of the legislation recently 
put before the Alberta legislature, which would restrict children under the age, or young people under the age of 18 from receiving the, well, first of all, surgery, and I think under the age of 17 from receiving the kind of chemical interventions that you yourself received. Um, are we doing a good thing here, or are we uh, sentencing frustrated young people to kill themselves because they can't change sex when they want to? I believe the legislations would have helped because the doctors would have been forced to do a proper cognitive assessment. And if the doctors actually treat the suicidal ideation and the root cause of that, for one, a lot of these kids may not even be trans in the first place. And the ones who are will learn how to live well-rounded lives before they even have to get any chemicals. So by the time you were 18, you might not have wanted to do this? No, absolutely. I wasn't even sure when I went in. I simply just said to my doctors, hey, I saw this thing online. I think this might be what it is, but you're the expert. So like, let me know do the testing and all that and figure it out. But they didn't test me properly. You don't just let somebody walk in and say, I have cancer. Can I have chemo? You don't give them chemo. You have to do a test first. But if you don't properly test them and just hand them out all the time, like the other thing as well, me getting these drugs when I wasn't supposed to have them, people who actually needed them now can't have them. So, like, What kind of a test would have been appropriate for you? Knowing I had other mental health issues. Um, not presuming that me being sexualized when I was young was just happenstance, because that seems to be a common theme, and they just bring it into the diagnostics as well, saying that just seems to be a theme. That's okay, though. You're still trans. And it's like, I wasn't, though. And if they can make a mistake once, they can make a mistake again, and that's just unfortunate. They need to have a better system there. Last thoughts, Kelly Lou? Um, youth need an opportunity to pause and to think. Um, as an adult, I thought I was informed. I had no idea how politicized the trans lobby has made research. And um, I am pleased to support the policies of Premier Daniel Smith and her government and um, her stance to end the bullying, uh, especially in regards to the doctors and the researchers and the state of the research that there will once again be open debate about what's going on in the medical field and for it no, to no longer be politicized. Look, this is, uh, I think you two are incredibly brave to take your stories public and to... Uh, Stand out in the open and tell them, knowing that there could very well be people who are militantly opposed yes. to what you are now, the message that you are now trying to put out. What is the name of your organization? D-Trans Alliance Canada. And uh, do you have many members? No. <laughs> I, I, I've got a mailing list. I've had a small group of people reaching out to me. Mm -hmm. The hardest part of getting something started is... We are told that it would be better death before detransition. So it's this idea that we are shameful for existing. I've been told my telling my story is a threat to trans healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a real effort to silence our voices. Um, there was a trans advocate at the rally the first weekend in November who was saying that detransitioners' voices shouldn't even be heard on this issue. Uh, well, that's a pretty pretty common uh, reaction from the left when they hear something that they that they can't answer. Um, one last question that I, I know some of our viewers are going to want to know: How are things with mom and dad? Uh, my father actually passed away in about 2021, but I was able to to be very close with him beforehand, and uh, my mom and I are getting significantly closer, and she's uh, very happy that I've. Come back and no doubt. It out. Yes. Okay. Kelly Lynn, Faith, thank you very much for joining us today and being as open and frank about your personal stories as they are. This is one of the issues of our day. It won't last forever because these kinds of things don't. Mm -hmm. There's something else, and heaven only knows what it'll be. But uh, for today, you are voices for a reason, and 
I don't suppose the premier of the province minds at all that uh, you're saying with this set of rules have been in place in Ontario, you wouldn't be in this position today. Thank you both very much. You're welcome. For the Western Standard, I'm Nigel Hanford. <laughs>